Hello, I'm Simon Benjamin and this is the third of my lectures on uh, the topics of Fourier series, a bit of Fourier transforms and partial differ differential equations. So now, what have we got in lecture three? Uh, we've got integration and differentiation of Fourier series, checking it's legit. And then we talk a bit about functions that are not periodic but are defined only in a finite range. So they just aren't defined outside of that range. And then the Dirichlet conditions will tell us something pretty interesting, which is, is it always okay to, uh, to use the Fourier series technique? Does it have its limits? And then we'll go on to look briefly at uh, Parseval's theorem, which is a theorem which for practical purposes is very interesting in thinking about how well a truncated Fourier series will do in terms of uh, capturing you know, the ideal infinite series. And then we will warm up, warm up for uh, Fourier transforms by taking the first step from Fourier series to Fourier transforms. And that first step is to replace our sines and cosses with just complex functions. Um, and it's still just a, a series, but having uh, sort of let that simmer for a bit, then in the next lecture, we will get into Fourier transforms. Okay, so let's start with the first of those topics. Can we differentiate and or integrate a Fourier series? Um, so on the one hand, you might be thinking, why not? And that's a fair thing to think. I suppose that it's a series that has an infinitely large number of terms. We've created it in a very specific way by analyzing another function and breaking it up. And we might wonder, is there anything unusual, anything to remark upon about the process of integration and differentiation? So, um, spoiler, the answer is yes, you can integrate or differentiate your Fourier series. Uh, you, you won't get a knock at the door from the maths police because you're not breaking any mathematical laws. It's completely legit. Still, there are some interesting things to see. And in fact, we um, can, can make a start just using the two Fourier series that we derived in the previous lecture. So what I'll do is I'll uh, draw their, their shape and, and write down the expressions for them, and then we'll see. So here we are with the functions that we uh, found out, we, we worked out in the last lecture. At the top here is our square wave, uh, which we found we could build just with a, a sum of sine terms each sine n divided by n. And then further down here, we have our triangular wave, um, which we built from causes. And crucially, uh, there, each term, as it turned out, was divided by n squared, so cos nx over n squared. So actually, if you think about it, what it means is the terms get weaker. They vanish away more quickly in the case of the triangular wave. And perhaps that's not surprising considering the triangular wave is actually a bit closer to um, a, a regular cos function. The uh, square wave is clearly you know, making a big effort, <laughs> and needs a lot of terms with significant um, weighting of, of those terms in order to be, build these abrupt changes. Anyway, what can we say about integration and differentiation? Well, before I, um, maybe you're already spotting something interesting here, but maybe I can make it more obvious if I uh, give us a slightly different uh, square wave function. So again, up to my, as usual, not great sketching skills. Uh, I think you can see that this is um, just a shifted and scaled uh, square wave. But um, what's it's shifted and scaled to? Well, let's uh, just um, I can write it out again, actually. We can see what we're going to need to do here. Um, previously, uh, well, we need to double the amplitude, right? So uh, let's have a look at our little uh, function, which was our original one that we've derived in the lectures. I think the notes actually derive the new one directly, as I recall. If we look at this term, this is controlling what the amplitude of the oscillation is going to be. If we double it, it will double the strength of all the terms in our sine series, and so it will double the strength of the oscillation, the amplitude of it. So we'll want to do that. And then uh, the other term, the plus term, this was here in order to shift us up. But actually, we no longer want that to be the case, because now this new function in the uh, blue shade is oscillating the same amount of time above and below the axis. So 
uh, we can see that that's going to be uh, let's let's okay let's uh, let's call that um, uh, h maybe h of x is equal to four over pi and then the sum only of the odd terms of indeed sine and x so actually a simpler Fourier series a little bit simpler um, because we we've, we've got rid of the constant really so now uh, what can you see that is uh, a relationship between these two graphs I'll help you by um, moving them around a bit or uh, in fact let's remove the purple one uh, because that is just going to distract the eye now so that will take me a second so there I've got rid of the purple function so that we can just see our simplified square wave and our uh, triangular wave. Now can you see the relationship between these two functions just by looking at the graphs? Well, reflect on the fact, uh, let's look at the gradient of the triangular wave. The gradient of this, which would be dg by dx, here is equal to minus 1. And um, though there on the other side, uh, as we go up the next cycle, dg by dx, dg by dx becomes plus 1. So we have here uh, a function whose gradient is going minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1 as we work across the graph. That is exactly what our square wave is doing, except there's an extra minus sign. It's positive when the gradient of the triangular wave is negative and vice versa. So we should find that if we differentiate, if we work out dg by dx, it will work for us. Let's have a look. dg by dx, so I'm just uh, essentially I'm looking at this and differentiating it so I will get 0 from the constant and then plus 4 pi, just a constant outside of our sum, n odd of course, still uh, the same sum but we're differentiating every term so when we differentiate an infinite series we just differentiate every term of that series and we still have some other kind of infinite series. So cos will go to minus sine of nx, um, but we will also get a, an n factor coming out of that and cancelling with one of the n squareds in, uh, that we're dividing by. So uh, it's exactly what we expect. Uh, these are the same up to a minus sign, and uh, that makes sense. Now, here's an interesting question. What will happen if we differentiate again? Or what would happen if we integrated our triangular wave? So these two functions are adjacent to each other in the sort of hierarchy of differentiation and integration. But what are the functions that live one step further up and further down that ladder, so to speak? Well, to work that out, uh, we can certainly write it down, right? We can go ahead and differentiate a second time. We'll do that. And, but then to look at them, we'll come over to Mathematica, because it's quite, it's quite interesting to think about that. So let me get a, a clean screen and we'll uh, summarize what we've got so far. So those are the two we already know. Let's uh, try integrating the triangular wave. This was the triangular one. Uh, so we'll, I, I forget which letters I've used so far, so I'm going to call this function a of x just because I'm pretty sure I haven't used that. a of x would be pi by 2 of x and then we would have to integrate every term in our series. Cos integrates to sine, and uh, what we'll need to do is give ourselves another n factor to make that happen, right? So sine of nx over uh, n cubed now. And we can verify that, that we would differentiate, so that the hierarchy here is that you differentiate. So d by dx of this mystery function a and we'll see what it looks like in a bit, um, will give us our triangular wave. And then we've already argued on the previous screen that d by dx of that gives us our um, square wave, the particular, um, the particular version of the square wave that goes plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. Okay. And what would happen if we differentiated again? Well, I'll call that function b, and we'll uh, just work it out. Well, hmm. Sine differentiates to cos, no problem. It will give us another factor of n, which will actually cancel out the, um, the n that we've been dividing by. And that's, a, that's an interesting one. Sine differentiates to cos, cos nx, that's okay. 
It's a, uh, we didn't even need to lose the sign, sorry. But um, what's interesting about that is that all the cases above have the property that as we go up our series of terms, we divide by something. We divide by n cubed or n squared or n, which means that the they get weaker. So the, the, the weighting coefficient of each sign or cos term is weaker than the last as we go up. But now this thing we've written down here doesn't do that. It's actually a sum of all possible causes um, from, so co uh, which are odd. So cos x, cos 3x, cos 5x, and so on, without any weighting at all. And that's a, that's a strange, um, you know, it, for sort of convergence reasons, we're comfortable with the idea that if we've got an infinite series, we'd rather like them, the terms to get weaker and weaker, so that we're, when we're out to the very large terms, it really doesn't you know, make much difference. We can, we can truncate it at some point. So let's see what those things look like in Mathematica. Okay, so here we are with Mathematica. I've saved a bit of time by typing in all four of our functions that we wanted to have a look at. We've already seen the triangular wave and the square wave before, but um, we can have another look at them just to get ourselves started. So if I, um, uh, so currently my plot command is only plotting g and h. And uh, let's just see that they look the way we um, want them to. But yeah, and the, yes, they do. By the way, I'm uh, doing a couple of extra tricks for those who are following along maybe with the Mathematica coding side of things. I've just put in a variable here, max. That's the highest term index that I want to go to because I want to go to the same number of terms for each of my functions to make it a fair comparison. So you see that max appears over here. And this is the, uh, this, this little sequence here tells the sum function how we want to sum. Previously, in Mathematica, we used the 2n plus 1 trick and just summed from 1 upwards. Here, um, this just shows you how you can do the odd-only trick if you want to in Mathematica. You just say uh, you're summing over n. You want to start from n is equal to 1. You want to go up to n max, here 81. And then this 2 just means in steps of 2. So since you're starting from 1, it will give you just the odd, the odd-numbered um, cases. So that's that's what that is, and hopefully I've typed across all the functions correctly. We can see that the triangular wave is exactly what we remember it it did. It goes from pi down to zero at pi, so indeed the gradient of that is um, minus one. And uh, here we see that our square wave, um, because now it's just a strict sequence of uh, differentiation that I've written, so our function h does have a minus sign in front of it, and we can see, yes, uh, the square wave, of course, we've seen it before, we're not uh, surprised to find this, but it is indeed giving us a minus one plus one, um, as we expect from the gradient, so that all works. We see our little uh, overshoot in the square wave, which uh, was the Gibbs phenomenon, the, that, that, uh, that thing that never quite goes away as our square wave gets better and better. So that's, that's what we expect to see. Now, let's um, change uh, to focus on the transition from A uh, which is uh, the integral of our triangular wave uh, versus the triangular wave itself. So let's go AG there and execute that. Okay, so it, it, Mathematica will rescale it each time, so things will seem to jump around in height. Um, what it's showing us is, that, well, of course, we have that, that constant term has become uh, now a function of x. So we have a, an underlying uh, diagonal there, and then we have a wiggle on it. What we could do... Um, just to sort of, because the, the in a sense, that, that linear x term isn't very interesting. So we could get rid of that. We could just times that by zero. And then it won't be strictly the integral anymore, of course. So we'll just be investigating the oscillatory part of it. But let's see what that looks like. What would we, what would, what do you expect it to look like? So it's a sum of sine terms. Um, and uh, they're divided by n cubed. Whereas for the triangular wave, they're divided by n squared. Now remember that the difference between the triangular and the, and the square wave uh, was um, that the triangular has its terms falling off more rapidly. It has n squared. And the triangular wave, looks, I would say, looks closer to being a simple sine or cos than the square wave, which is you know, quite far from being a sine or cos. So um, the strength of the terms is, falls off more rapidly in the case of the function that looks more like a simple sine or cos. In a sense, it doesn't need as much of those higher frequencies to build the, to build the target function. 
So now we um, have uh, an even more aggressive fall off, right? N cubed, very aggressive. Um, so uh, already by the, uh, the n equals 5 term, we'll have be dividing by 125. Uh, what would we expect to see? Well, uh, perhaps you said we'll expect to see something that looks a lot like a simple sine function, and we do. So it, it's, it, I mean, even to my eye, I can hardly tell that there's anything wrong with that as a simple sine function. But there is, you know, because it's a sum of a large number of terms. It's sine um, plus uh, sine 3 over 27, right, 3 cubed. So already the, the, the very first term above the basic sine is very heavily suppressed, and so that's why it looks so sine-like. So that, that's fairly easy to understand. That one maybe wasn't super challenging. Let's come on to this weird beast, this B function, that is a sum of causes that no longer drop off in strength at all. What will we see there? So let's, uh, for reference, let's uh, have our H function, uh, which is just our square wave, but we'll put that up against our B uh, function, as we're calling it, which is supposed to be the, differenti the differentiated function um, that, uh, so it's d dh by dx. What would we expect? Well, um, the uh, square wave is, of course, a series of constants, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. So in those regions, the differential should be 0, but then it, it, it abruptly changes from one to another, so there the gradient should be infinite. Um, hmm. Well, what will we see? Well, we see something pretty crazy. <laughs> so let's, maybe I should even turn down the total number of terms to 11 or something. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Excuse me. There we go, to 11. And uh, so here it's a little bit more, we can see it with the naked eye a bit more clearly. We see our, our square wave starting to form up. We only have 11 terms, so it doesn't look that great. But we see this differentiated function is, is pretty crazy looking already. Um, it certainly seems to be getting very large peaks where the gradient uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the complete function would be infinite. Um, but it, it's, it, uh, conversely, it um, is oscillating around pretty crazily where it's supposed to be giving us zero. Now let's uh, boost back up to a larger number of terms, maybe 51 terms or something. And we can see that the amplitude of the oscillations is not dying away, although they are getting more and more frequent. So we're sort of finding the limits there of where it's actually useful to move using our differentiation. Yes, we can differentiate our sum. There's no problem mathematically, but we need to have a think about what we're doing before we would say uh, just use that as part of a numerical analysis. Let's move on to the next topic, functions in a finite range. What do we mean by that? Well, consider one of the physical examples which I said uh, in the later part of the course we might use Fourier series to deal with would be a plucked guitar string. And I, arg I argued, I think it was in lecture one, that a one uh, cycle of our triangular wave looks a bit like a plucked guitar string. Let me remind you of uh, what I was waffling on about there. I can't really draw a guitar uh, very well, but let's uh, imagine it's something like this kind of shape. Uh, I suppose that's uh, not too bad, evocative of a guitar. And I also don't really know where the strings go, but I have a feeling that we could say there's a string that sort of goes like this when it's uh, relaxed, but when the string is being uh, plucked by the guitarist, and let's say that they uh, just do very simple thing and they, they just pluck it with one finger. Here we go. Let's finish it off. There we are. So um, this looks like one piece of our triangular wave, sure, uh, but the point is it's not defined outside of range. We could put some coordinates on here. Let's say that this is uh, x equals zero and the other end where the string is also attached is uh, x is equal to, I don't know, l for the, the length of the relaxed string. And um, there's also perhaps some height here. Presumably we can say that we've displaced it by d away from the relaxed point. And then we could um, say, what is the shape of the string? So we could uh, put on a, an axis here, call it f of x maybe. And we could write down what is that, that, what is that shape of the string at time t equals zero. And then we would write something like this. Sure, we can just look at this diagram and work it out well. Um, Clearly x is, uh, so my idea was this was halfway along, 
x is equal to l over 2. So x is equal to l over 2 is clearly the important point. Uh, previously, when we were doing the triangular wave and defining it as compactly as we could mathematically, we used the modulus because it would capture the fact that the gradient goes up and then the gradient goes down for us. So we would play around with that is, is one way to think. And so I would say, OK, I'm interested in x minus x minus 2. So it's, it's clearly important for the function shape how far we are from the center point. Um, so I can uh, go ahead and uh, consider that and the magnitude of that. Uh, but um, hang on a minute. When x is equal to 0, I uh, want the whole thing to be uh, 0. So I better have um, l minus 2 minus that whole thing. What does that give me? So that would give me at uh, x is equal to 0 or x is equal to l, it would be 0. And um, at uh, x is equal to l over 2, the thing in the modulus would disappear, and that would give me 0. And so the whole thing would be l over 2. So actually then I need to multiply the whole thing uh, to scale it from l over 2 to, what did we say, d as our height. So that would be, um, uh, I would divide by l over 2, which is the same as multiplying by 2 over l and then times it by d. And we could simplify that expression down, um, but that I think should be uh, what we're after. The point is that that function would be for uh, x is greater or equal to 0 is less than or equal to l. And outside of that range, uh, there's just no answer to the question, what does the function look like? It's not defined. Um, there's nothing out here. Uh, there, there's, it's not that there's another copy of the string or that anything else is happening. There's just no definition of the function um, when we go for less than 0 or greater than L. Can we use Fourier series in analyzing something like that? Well, we can. Um, if we, As long as we don't care what's outside that range, what we can do is just build a periodic function that does match the function we're interested in over its range, and then is just periodic in some way that's convenient to us, so that we, we introduce a definition of our function outside of the constrained range for our own convenience. And then the Fourier series we build will match our uh, function in the in the specific range and it will, yeah, it will match whatever we've invented for the range outside of that. So simply, we can tackle not only periodic functions, but also functions that are defined just in a finite range, because for those, we can create a periodic function that, uh, that does contain the, the correct segment. Here, the obvious thing would just be to extend that triangular wave um, outwards. Um, now, I'll just put a little bit of a warning here. When we actually come to do this trick in real physical situations, we want to say, sure, I've got this problem. It's defined from here and here. I need to use Fourier series. OK, I'll invent a function. We'll have to be a little bit cautious. Um, and it's easiest to see that in a real physical situation. So I'll postpone that discussion for later. But I'll just put a remark here that generally when you extend your function out, you don't want to put a discontinuity in your function at the point where, um, you, where, the, where the defined region ends. So now, uh, this is quite fun, I like this, the Dirichlet conditions. So speaking informally, the notes are a little bit more putting things rigorously, but again a mathematician would, would specify this with a lot more care. Um, what we can say is that the Fourier series technique our technique for building a periodic, or as we now realize, even just a function over a finite range, for building that using signs and causes will work if we meet all three of the following conditions. If we break one of them, then it's not guaranteed to work. So first, a finite, the function that we're trying to build, should have a finite number of maxima and minima. I'll just write max, min in one period. Of course, it's going to have an infinite number of maximum and minima, maximum and minima over its full range because it's periodic. Uh, so in order to break this rule, we would have to have an infinite number of maximum and minima, so an infinite number of oscillations in a finite, in one cycle of the function. And that sounds 
uh, pretty crazy, right? Why, why would we as physical scientists encounter a situation where in some kind of finite range, like our guitar string or our bar that we were just imagining was had some heat distribution, some temperature distribution, why would it have an infinite number of oscillations just in a finite range? That's kind of unphysical. I mean, after all, we know, by the way, that matter is essentially atomic. So, we, you know, <laughs> you, you can't have an infinite number of oscillations if your material is fundamentally granular like that anyway. So that sounds like it's not going to worry us too much as a limitation on how we as physical scientists might use the Fourier series, might worry a mathematician. What's next? The next one, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, let me copy it down because I'm that lazy. A finite number of um, discontinuities. In one periodic cycle, oh, I meant, okay, periodic cycle, or one period, let's, do, let's keep it simple. Yeah, um, that is, uh, if anything, that's, 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 that's more bizarre. Right? A discontinuity being a point where you get an abrupt break, uh, it's the, if anything, that will be even stranger than having a finite number of maxima and minima, minima right? So if our function is, is, is having an abrupt change, again, in the physical reality, probably isn't infinitely abrupt anyway, right? It's, it's some kind of very sharp gradient. So we're unlikely to have any discontinuities, really. Um, although, we, you know, we might approximate things like the case where we took a hot bar and a cold bar and put them next to each other. And then we can say, oh, that's, you know, that's an instantaneous change. OK. Um, but to have an infinite number of them in one period, that's also pretty crazy sounding. Um, and what's the third one? Because th these two don't worry me at all as a physical scientist. I, should, I don't think, like, if I, if I had these in my model, why, you know, I, the question is, why have I written those things down? It seems unlikely. So, um, and this is a, an interesting one. The, um, the absolute value, which is sort of, which means the, the mod, if you like, of our function, absolute value of the function we're trying to build, let, let's write mod fx, is integrable. Um, So uh, it means that it makes sense to work out the total area under our function if we take the uh, mod of it. So, for example, it's not a function that integrates to infinity, has an infinite amount of area underneath it. It can have infinities, so it can go off to infinity, that's okay. But it has to do so in such a fashion that the total area underneath the graph um, or uh, total area integrated in one cycle remains finite. So if, if a function does go off to infinity periodically, and so an example of that would be, uh, let's say, 1 over cos or 1 over, tan, uh, 1 over sine, because they go to 0, so then 1 over that goes off to in, uh, infinity, right? But that is still okay for us, as long as it does it sufficiently sharply. Oops, that's a bad drawing. Maybe let's try a little bit. I'm sort of trying to create the idea here that we have a repeating cycle of going off to infinity. Um, as long as we can still integrate under that, which in many cases we can, uh, and it comes to a finite amount, then we're still good. So again, that, that's the kind of thing where I would have to ask why on earth am I dealing with a function, if the function is strange enough to break these rules, um, then I probably shouldn't be <laughs> dealing with that function in the first place. But let's um, go over to Mathematica and just play around very quickly to see if we can think of something that does break at least one of these rules. Let's do that. So we've come over to Mathematica here and I've just put in a good old cos just to have a starting point and plotted it um, essentially over two complete cycles. And we can see that this is a function that has uh, over a, a complete cycle it will essentially have a minimum and a maximum. Um, now, what the conditions are telling us uh, is that 
that's fine. And it would be fine for any number of maxima and minima as long as it's finite. What could we do to make x have, uh, to make our function have an infinite number of um, maxima and minima? Well, we can still use a cos function, but then we would need to mess around with what is the argument of the cos function here. We would need to replace this with uh, something else such that the overall function indeed has an infinite number of oscillations. We could do this if uh, the function, as x changes over a finite range, the function sees an infinite change, right? So what we would want is that we put some other function of x here, um, you know, uh, some kind of function of x should go in here, such that when we change x, um, for example, pushing it through zero from positive to negative, uh, the function changes by an infinite range. And if that sounds exotic, well, consider just good old 1 over x. So 1 over x, of course, um, goes to infinity, uh, positive infinity, as we um, approach it from, as we, as we come down from a positive value of x to 0, and then it uh, has uh, a negative infinity when we approach from the other direction. So if we were uh, plotting here on our diagram 1 over x, uh, we would see this, right? So these lines are going off to infinity. But now if we feed this into our cos function, then as, we, as x changes over a finite range, cos will see an infinite range, and we may get what we want. So let's just uh, do that. Yeah, so now we're going to need to zoom in a bit, but what we're seeing here is uh, a lot of oscillations. So let's zoom right in to say uh, 0.1. Uh, let's look as we go through the 0 to 0.1. What do we have? Yeah, there we are. So uh, we're getting, of course, more and more and more oscillations because what cos sees is changing more and more rapidly. So if we had a periodic function that, let's say, is everything you're seeing on the screen right now, but then repeated in cycles, um, so just uh, um, that thing repeated over and over again, we could not expect to create a Fourier series that's capable of replicating that, even in the limit of uh, an infinite number of terms in our Fourier series. But that's fair enough, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a... Again, it's a very pathological function compared to what you would expect to encounter when you're just trying to model the reality of physical problems, material science problems, engineering problems. So the short story is the Dirichlet conditions are giving us uh, such a broad range of... It's so hard to get outside of the Dirichlet conditions and, give, and provide something that it will not be possible to construct a Fourier series for that... Um, we should just not worry about it as physical scientists. If we're coming along with a function sufficiently weird to break the Dirichlet conditions, then why we shouldn't probably not be using that function in the first place. So the, 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 the slogan is, I suppose, uh, stop worrying and love the Fourier series. <laughs> that is, that's, a, I got, that's a quote from a film, or rather a misquote from a film. I, I wonder if anyone watching this will actually know what the film is. Put it, put it in the comments, if there's comments attached to wherever you're seeing this. Okay, so the, the, the Dirichlet conditions are basically good news for us as physical scientists. Let's come back and uh, finish up the last part of this lecture, which was... Um, oh, there's two more things to do, actually, before uh, we can really wrap up. So uh, what we've done is the Dirichlet conditions. I don't know why I previously had a tick with that, but now we've earned that tick. Now we'll need to look at Parseval's theorem and errors. It's actually uh, the next day by my time, so uh, if, uh, if, if the light looks a little bit different suddenly, that's why. <laughs> okay, on we go. So here is Parseval's theorem. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, actually. At least in this form, there's a few different ways you can write it for different levels of generality, but this is what we want. Uh, we're saying we have a Fourier series, f of x here. It's the usual Fourier, Fourier series. It has period 2 pi. Um, we're using the usual notation. And then the statement is that if we wanted to square that uh, function and then integrate over one complete cycle, 
Now, of course, we would get some kind of positive uh, number because we've it, it can only have a positive sign. We squared it. What will it come to? Well, up to a factor of um, 1 over pi here, uh, we will see that it's just, uh, we get the answer just by summing up the squares of the coefficients from our Fourier series. So we sum up all the b squareds, uh, or we square all the b's and sum them up, is a better way to say it perhaps. We square all the a coefficients and add them up, except for a0, which gets squared and divided by 2 um, before it's added into the total. Now, I'll say a quick word about how we might prove this. Actually, it's pretty straightforward to prove. How would we prove it? What we'd need to do is square, of course, our whole Fourier series here. That whole thing would need to get squared. It's already got an infinite sum of terms, two infinite sums of terms in it. So we'd get more infinite sums of, t of terms which are made out of the, the square of this object. So among other things, we'd have cross terms in there, right? We'd have every possible... Um, uh, cos-like term, so for example, a subscript 37 cos 37x would be multiplied by not only itself, but also every other um, possible cos and every possible sign. And so that would seem like it would give us a really complex expression, and it would be to write it down pretty complex. But because we're integrating over one complete cycle, we'd be able to use a similar observation to the one we used in the first lecture when we were getting at expressions for a n and b n, which is that the cross terms just vanish. So everything that's a combo of one of the causes and one of the signs, or a cause with a different cause or a sign with a different sign, they all vanish. And we just end up with the terms that are just going to be, um, for example, cos of 37x times cos of 37x to give us cos squared. Um, that's the only kind, the terms like that are the only ones that survive. And they, of course, have their coefficient, in that case, a subscript 37 squared. And that is um, the secret to how we would uh, prove this, because we only end up with those squared coefficients, because only the corresponding uh, cos squared or sine squared terms survive. So that's that's a sort of waffly, hand-wavy description of how we would prove it. What? Why is it interesting? Well, uh, there are a lot of applications, in fact. One of them is to figure out the amount of energy stored in a field. So uh, think about um, a microwave, like a microwave oven. That's a cavity field problem because the microwave strength must be zero uh, on the boundaries of the inside of that metal box. And that means that only certain uh, frequencies or waves of certain period are allowed. Uh, and in fact, we would find that the Fourier series is a good tool for describing the field in that situation. But if we wanted to know how much energy is in the field, we'd have to square the amplitude of the field and that would bring us to um, Parseval's theorem to actually work out the total energy. In fact, we would see from this description that the total energy is can be thought of as the energy in each of the different allowed modes in that field. But we won't look at that example in detail. Instead, I'm going to uh, ask you a question and we'll see how Parseval's theorem allows us to answer it. So I have a sketch on my next uh, screen here. It shows two different functions, g of x and e of x. And what we're um, what I'm trying to show here is that these functions are trying to do the same thing, that is to be the square wave, in, except g of x has, has got it. So g of x, we could just say, is the square wave. And e of x is an approximation to it, very much like those ones that Mathematica was generating for us. So um, to put it simply, e of x is not perfect, but is trying to replicate g of x. And we can see with these little orange uh, notes here that I've, I've drawn on just here, that um, in that region there, we can see that uh, we sometimes overshoot and sometimes undershoot. Now my question for you is, how would we go about coming up with a single number that describes how bad the mismatch is? I just want one number. I want that number to be zero if there's no mismatch. So if um, e of x had actually done a perfect square wave, our score, our defect score, would be zero. And I want it to be a positive number that reflects how bad the mismatch is. So if we draw on here an even poorer approximation, perhaps just a, a sine function, which would obviously, you know, it would, it would have those oscillations, but it would be uh, completely failing to get the the flat segments and the vertical lines, that would be a much worse positive score. So I, how can I um, figure out how to generate a number that describes the defect here? Well, 
uh, one thing is that uh, I clearly only need to look over one uh, complete cycle of this thing because uh, it's um, it has period 2 pi. So if we've understood what the mismatch looks like over one complete cycle, then we're done. Another remark is that, um, well, uh, so that that makes me think of doing an integral, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's write down what we might be thinking about at this point. Let's integrate 0 to 2 pi of, uh, say, g of x minus e of x and uh, make that uh, our measure. Would that be a good measure? Let's, I don't know, write down delta to give it a symbol for our defect. Not quite yet, because that would mean that when the, uh, as I've written it, when the g function is above the uh, e function, then uh, we would contribute some positive to uh, some positive uh, area to our integral. But when it's below, it would be negative, and it would sort of be saying, oh, actually, I'm improving in this point. I'm reducing uh, the penalties, the total penalty score, and that's not right because it's bad to be mismatching by overshooting, and it's also bad to be mismatching by um, going underneath the target function. Two wrongs don't make a right, so we need to penalize for both those cases. What that means is we need to get rid of the sign of the difference between these two functions. Now, one way to do that would be to take the um, the absolute. We could uh, just do this kind of thing, uh, but working with the absolute value of things mathematically. Um, is a little bit uh, less messy than the alternative, sorry, a little bit more challenging than the alternative, which is to just square. Why not just square the difference? That will get rid of the sign. That will also mean, by the way, that the further off, um, the, 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 the larger the discrepancy, the more aggressively we'll penalize it because we're squaring now. But that's probably not a bad thing. Um, we, we should be more concerned the, the more uh, the, the functions mismatch. So how about that? for a measure of how to um, uh, describe how badly two functions mismatch. Okay, so going back to Parseval's theorem and thinking how we might uh, use that to get some insight into the question I've just asked about the defect, let's just define our two functions as Fourier series. So we've set out here the coefficients um, uh, for them. Uh, I've used lowercase a for the function g and uppercase a, and similarly b, um, for the function e. But they're both Fourier series, they both have periods 2 pi. So then I want to define the difference between those two Fourier series, and of course that's just going to be another Fourier series, another function with some period 2 pi. So let me just paste that in, save a bit of time. Uh, we can put it about there. So what I'm saying is, I'm defining a new function, f of x, which is equal to, is defined as, g of x minus e of x. Not sure if it's helpful to use these colors. I thought it might be interesting. So it's the blue function minus the purple function. And so if it is just yet another Fourier series. So of course we'll write it, whoops, of course we'll write it in these, this format, our usual expression. I need yet another um, pair of symbols because I've already used lowercase a and capital A. So now I'm using alpha and beta to be the coefficients. But we can immediately see, I think, that these coefficients are just going to be the differences between the corresponding coefficients in our functions g and e. So here I've written that down. I hope that's obvious. So for example, we have a cos of 37, I always go for 37 for some reason. We have a cos of 37x that must be in our g Fourier series, and we have a cos of 37x that will be in our e um, Fourier series. And when we take the difference of those two Fourier series, We'll still have some kind of cos of 37x term, but now it's that particular coefficient, alpha subscript um, 37 will be uh, lowercase uh, a37 minus um, capital uh, a37. Well, it takes a bit longer to say than, than hopefully it is to see. Now, what can we do with that fact? Well, of course, what we're going to do is put this f of x into our um, Parseval's theorem and see what we get. So let me paste that in now. So there I've just pasted it in, and we can see this is just Parseval's theorem where I've substituted in my definition of f of x as the difference of our two functions. And um, so correspondingly, where previously we just had the sum of the squares of, co of it, the coefficients of f of x, we still do, but now we see that those things are each the difference of the coefficients in our two source Fourier series, the, let's say, ideal one and the approximate one. Well, that's kind of useful. It allows us to quickly work out how close one Fourier series will be to another one. 
uh, will this number, when we work it out, be large or small? But is there any uh, kind of, uh, let's say, interesting observation that we can immediately take away from this? There is, actually. Suppose that I was working with Fourier series in some numerical modeling problem, and I decided to truncate my Fourier series because I wanted to keep the calculation time down. Let's say that I, let, let's make my Fourier series the truncated one, uh, the EX function, so it will have the capital letters as its uh, coefficients, and I will say that I, um, are going to I'm going to have that my AN are correctly equal to the, the ideal AN, and my BN are correctly equal to the ideal BN for n is less than or equal to 20. I don't know. I'm only willing to use up to the first 20 terms in my Fourier series before I truncate it. And when I say I truncate it, what that means, of course, is that a n is going to be equal to 0, and so is b n, capital A, and b n are equal to 0 for index n is greater than 20. That's a truncated Fourier series. But before I start running my model and generating the results of my research, I might think to myself, well, actually, should I perhaps boost up those um, first 20 coefficients somehow to compensate for the fact that I'm truncating the series? Might seem to make intuitive sense. If I'm going to throw away a bunch of terms, maybe the ones I'm keeping should be increased or in some other way tweaked around to get the best possible fit. Now, Parseval's theorem tells us, no, don't do that. You'll make it worse. If you try messing around with the terms you are going to use, um, you'll only make things worse. And we can see that because this, uh, our, our defect uh, measure here, is just made of a bunch of um, squared objects. So each one can at best contribute zero. Otherwise, it will contribute some positive amount. If I do think about those terms for the first, uh, for n is up to and including 20, I can see that if I, if I use the right values, I'll contribute zero. And then, of course, there's a bunch of contributions from the missing terms. Um, but I can't do better than zero for those early terms. If I beef them up a bit, I will just contribute some positive error from them as well. So the best thing to do is to simply use the correct Fourier terms up to the truncation point, And there's just no way to do any better than that, um, short of just extending the series and having a truncation point that's further out. That is, provided that this uh, integral of the squared of the defect is a good measure for how much trouble the, um, the, the, the approximation will cause me in my modeling, and, you know, it, it may well be a good measure for reasons that we've discussed. Okay, so that's enough about that. There's enough about uh, Parseval's theorem. Let's come on now to another topic. So all of this is just a, a quick reminder, and it's not in this lecture course to explain about complex numbers. Um, but uh, hopefully you've met this kind of thing before. Otherwise, it might be a good time to, to stop and uh, look into that a bit. Um, the bottom line is that this, these, these rules that I've written down here allow us to translate from complex exponentials into sine and cos or from sine, of, sine and cos into complex exponentials. So let's uh, go ahead now and uh, do that. I'm going to paste in here. I'm going to quickly write out the Fourier series that we have seen so many times that must be becoming pretty familiar by now, I hope. There it is, uh, the, the, the usual expression. But now our challenge is to translate that into the new form of using complex exponentials. So we simply need to do a substitution. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit to make a bit of room. And let's do it. So there we are. I've uh, quickly uh, pasted in that line. And it's just a direct substitution, right? We're just using the rules at the top of the screen. But now we want to start uh, collecting things up so that it looks like a sum over these complex exponentials. So we need to tidy that up, and that's, again, fairly easily done. What we, uh, Our constant term is just sitting there. It's not doing anything uh, for the time being. So we have, then, our sum. Let's do the positive e to the i n x's. So n is equal to 1 to infinity still of, um, that's going to be a n over 2 uh, plus uh, b n over uh, 2i e to the positive um, i n x. And then a very simple, a similar expression now, n is equal to 1 to infinity. But now, of course, the difference of those terms minus b n over 2i. 
e to the minus i n x. Let me move everything back a little bit to stop myself coming too far over to the right. There we go. We can also scroll up a bit, make a bit more space. Now one thing I can notice is that uh, if I wanted to, I could uh, put the i onto the top here. So let me zoom a bit. Um, what I can do is for this bn over 2i term, I could multiply top and bottom by i, and that would uh, just give me a minus sign and i on the top. So let, I'm going to do that, I think. So I'll erase that one down there and make it a minus sign. And similarly, over on the other side, that will have a similar effect, but now it will give us a plus i. So, okay, that's a slight adjustment. Now, for reasons that I hope will become apparent very shortly, I'm going to do something that might look a bit weird. I'm going to take our term here, which looked perfectly uh, reasonable, and make it look a bit weirder. I'm going to say I would actually like to substitute from, uh, instead of my index n that I was running over, which was from 1 to infinity, I'd actually like to sum over all the negative values of n. So I could write that sum now as n is equal to negative infinity up to uh, negative 1, which seems like it's just going to make things more confusing, but okay. If I insist on doing that, then I can see that uh, my a n, well remember a n and b n are only defined for positive values of n, so oof, I'm going to have to, for example, put a little um, magnitude symbol on there just so that uh, I don't end up uh, referring to a, a variable that doesn't exist. And I'll have to do it for the b n as well, so that doesn't seem to have helped much. It does mean, however, that I can drop the minus sign from the e to the i n x. Okay, well, that's, that's the same thing. It's still giving me all the same terms that I had before, but it's now running over negative values of the integer. Now, why does it help to do that? Uh, well, let's uh, keep trying to tidy things up by introducing some symbols, c, which will replace, uh, do the same job as these uh, differences, sums and differences of the a and b uh, constants. So it would be neater if we introduce c n is equal to a half a n minus i b n. And I'll say that definition is the case for n is um, uh, greater than uh, zero. And I'll have another slightly different definition for cn uh, for when n is less than zero based on the term I just wrote above. So, um, okay, that's for n is less than zero. And I'll also have one just for cn, for c0, and that's just going to be a half a0. Now, if I use this set of, um, actually, I'm going to move them into the top right of the screen. I'm going to shrink them down a little bit. If I use these new symbols, that does allow me to write my uh, Fourier series in now a very compact way. Uh, so I will my um, a zero over term, oh, my a zero over two term will become uh, c zero, and then the first of my two infinite sums, it's still n equals one to infinity, but now I can just use my c n term and write that e to the i n x, and my second sum. It's going to be still minus infinity to minus 1 of, well, cn, remembering that I have these two different flavors of cn that I've defined carefully, uh, that means it's going to be something that looks extremely similar. Now, it, it's even better than this in that I can compress this down further. Let's have a look. Clearly, the, the thing inside the sum is the same uh, for each of my infinite series. So I could just write that as a single infinite series that uh, is all the uh, negative integers and all the positive integers. doesn't include n is equal to 0, though. However, if I did put n is equal to 0 here, I would see that um, e to the i 0 is just 1, and so that would also match this term here. So what I'm saying is that that whole sum can be compressed down to a super compact form, which is just the sum over Oops, let me write it as neatly as it does, deserves to be written. A sum from n is minus infinity to infinity of simply cn e to the i n x. Okay, so I've highlighted that because that is a super compact expression, and it goes along 
with these expressions for cn, but they are not super compact, not yet, because they are defined in terms of um, an and bn. And if we wanted to use this Fourier series prescription, we'd have to go and look up what an and bn, what an and bn are, in order to compute the cn's. Let's see if we can do a little bit of work there, just to finish with, to see if we can get them into a really compact form as well and then we'll be able to write out the complex form of the Fourier series without reference to the old way of doing things at all. So I've given myself a fresh screen here, but with our coefficients up in the top right, we're gonna do a bit of work on them and see if we can't get them to be very neat as well. So here goes with our definition of Cn here for the uh, positive n, the one at the top there. It's a half, and then we need to do, we need to substitute in our definitions of An and Bn that we by now know very well. So that's, we have to integrate over one cycle, of course. So I'll do the mo minus pi to positive pi, because I think that will be neater here. And then cos of n x f x dx, as we know. And now we're doing minus i times the same thing for the bn terms. And I'll use the same integration range, sine of n x, and then it's f x. I nearly am running, I'm almost running out of room. Maybe I'll just fudge this one over a little bit. Make a bit, oops, didn't mean to do that. Make a bit of space. There we are. That just gives me enough room to finish up with my dx. There we are. Um, now we just need to work on that a bit, but in, immediately I see something, apart from the obvious fact that I can take one over pi out in front, one over two pi, I can write that as a single integral of cos of nx minus i sine of nx, and then all multiplied by fx dx. That is pretty uh, nice because I know how to rewrite that as just a complex exponential. So let's do it. 1 over 2 pi, and again over this range, pi to positive pi e to the, now I have to be careful here, e to the minus i n x. That's right. And uh, fx dx. So there's our expression for cn just directly using a complex exponential in the definition. What would happen if we worked through the um, second one down? This uh, highlight in orange, this one here. If we work that one out, um, we would actually get the same expression as it turns out. Being careful of those uh, uh, magnitude symbols, we would end up with exactly the same expression. So in fact, this uh, bottom one here, will, so I'll leave that as something that you can reproduce for yourself if you'd like, but that is actually for all n, um, because even the n is equal to zero works. Let's just check that. If we put n is equal to zero into our expression, we'll have one over two pi, the integral from over one complete cycle, of f of x because n equals zero will just make e to the i n x become one. But that is indeed uh, the correct definition of, um, well, uh, of a zero over two, which is, is what we want from c zero. So this expression here actually works for all values of c um, subscript n, positive, negative, and zero. That means we can now just summarize our complex form of our Fourier series very, very compactly. Let me write that in. So here we are. We've got the complex form of Fourier series. To be clear, we could have been using this from the beginning. We could have proposed that any periodic function breaks up like this all the way from lecture one, uh, and then we would have derived the CN terms. We, uh, in lecture one, we could have continued on to use this mechanism uh, when we came to analyze our square wave and our triangular wave, we could have used this language. But then I think we would have found it a bit less intuitive. It's nice to deal with signs and causes um, when you're trying to build things up and see what the partial series looks like and so on. So I think it makes sense to have postponed this translation into the complex form until now. Now's the time we need it because it will allow us to smoothly go over into the Fourier transform. And that is the topic of the next lecture. But I think that's enough for now, so thanks for listening, and remember that the notes uh, that you might find useful to go along with this course can be found, among other places, at simonb.info. Bye for now.